Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. I love this passage because it's coming from Paul, who's writing to a church in Ephesus in which there was some really messed up things happening. Like, you think our culture is bad. Artemis, they worship this goddess, uh, Artemis, there in Ephesus. She was the goddess of fertility. There was some really bad, heinous things that were occurring in that place. And Paul writes there to encourage them and to challenge them. And what we're going to talk about this morning is atypical, I feel like, for most weeks as a church. So do this, man. Turn to the person next to you and real quick just say, hey, it's not normally like this. Can you do that, both sides? Just turn to the person next to you. It's not normally like this. It's usually much worse than this. <laughs> uh, I want to tell you, uh, it's not going to be normally like this. Put your hands together and welcome those who join us live online through the power of the internet. We're glad you're here from whatever part of the, the world you are viewing from. I, I, uh, most of you may not know this, but I actually, at 23 years old, was diagnosed with hereditary hearing loss. And without getting into great detail, I eventually had a surgery in my left ear. They put a titanium rod in place of a bone in my ear so that I can hear. I haven't had surgery in this ear, so like if you talk to me in this ear, I am literally deaf in this ear. I will not hear you. It's not you. It's me. And at 23 years old, though, I had no idea that I had this hereditary hearing issue and I couldn't hear people. And so people would be talking to me and just think I was being rude because I wasn't talking back. In fact, I mean, heaven forbid anyone did anything embarrassing where certain sounds came out of their body that I did not hear. And then there was that awkward moment because I didn't hear it, but they heard it and I didn't acknowledge. You know what I'm talking about? We all tracking? It created some awkward situations in my life. It still does. But here's the difference today from when at 23 years old, a young guy who should not have hearing loss, I would literally be like a 95-year-old man and be like, huh, what'd you say? And I'd have people repeat things over and over again, and that's how I learned there was something going on. You see, you can't do anything about the problems in your life unless you address the issue. I didn't know that I had a hearing loss issue, but once I addressed it, they could actually do something because of surgery. I can now hear in my left ear. You see, this morning, the topic that we're going to talk about, for many people, it's very difficult for us to wrap our heads around it. In fact, most of us have never identified the problem in our lives, in our marriages, and the bickering that goes on within our family. I talk to to multiple people about big major life issues that are going on, problems in your life that you're addressing, people you're mad at at work, people who are mad at you at work, the kids and the problems that you're having there or with your parents, the problems that you're having. And we always think the battle is with them. It's with their spouse, it's with their boyfriend or girlfriend, it's with their boss, it's with whoever it is. According to the Bible, while you may have issues with those people, your enemy, your enemy is a spiritual one. Biblically, in the Old Testament, a few times it refers to him as the Ha-Satan. Ha is the in Hebrew, and Satan, you guessed it, is Satan or adversary. Mainly in Job chapter 1, it addresses him. And so this morning's message, I told you, is not normally like this. We are going to be talking about Satan. Oh, that was a fun thing to bring up at church this morning. We're going to address the very real enemy that we have. Now, people often accredit this uh, quote to C.S. Lewis. He actually was quoting a guy named Charles Baudelaire, who writes, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. You can't address the problem if you don't know that he exists. And see, for most of us as Christians... We're very aware of evil around us. See, when I first became a Christian, I had difficulty with the idea of Satan. I couldn't wrap my head around it. He's an actual being. Like, what, where did he come from? And I, I realized that some of us in the room right now, you have those questions. Until you identify your enemy, you won't be able to do spiritual battle with him. You will always think your battle is with all the people in your life. However, I've learned over time 
that for many people, you don't have any problem believing in Satan because you have seen the evil in this life. You've experienced it. It's been done to you. And you're very aware of the one who tempts you and is constantly um, speaking things into your life. That's what this morning is about. We're gonna acknowledge the existence of Satan and we're going to demonstrate that in scripture because the Bible talks a whole lot about it. Ephesians chapter six, verse 10. These uh, great words in, in my notes just went everywhere. If you were in the front row, you thought this was the splash zone. It's not Shamu, it's just my notes flying at your face. Ephesians chapter 6, 6 verse 10. You guys ready to study God's word together? Yeah. Mm, yeah, come on now. Verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggles is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of the, this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done, the, done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist with a breath, breastplate of righteousness, we will come back to that passage. Will you bow your heads and pray with me? Lord Jesus, we began this service by singing that we acknowledge the presence of your Holy Spirit here, and so again, we do that right now. We also acknowledge, God, that there is a spiritual battle going on before we ever even step foot into this room. And even here, I believe, God, your Bible speaks that there is a spiritual realm and that for each of us this morning, we're gonna be battling against um, hearing from you. And so we pray we would, Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are good and perfect and we desire to learn from you. We pray this in Jesus' name and all God's family said, amen. Any of you been to the South ever? You been down there? I love the South. It's warmer than 40 degrees in May in the South. And I uh, was traveling to the South a number of years ago and I saw a giant billboard you got to admit, the South is a little bit different than up here, isn't it? I drove on the interstate, and right along the interstate, there was this ginormous billboard that said, you better go to church or the devil's going to get you. <laughs> right? And while there is some truth to that, certainly, as we're acknowledging this morning, I also want to begin with a little precursor, a little caveat at the beginning here that every time something bad happens to you in your life, it wasn't always Satan that did it, right? The Bible is very clear on that. I've met people that are like, you know, they're walking down the street and they trip on a rock and they're like, the devil put that rock there. I know it. He was thinking about me. Some of you, you go in for that third piece of pie and you're like, Satan made this pie. Satan desires for me to eat this piece of pie. Sometimes the Bible acknowledges our fleshly carnal desires, and the temptations that come with it. However, that doesn't mean that the reality of Satan tempting you in your life is not real. And I wanna ask this question that was asked to me in February, and I don't know why I had never thought about it. And the question is this, if you're taking notes, what is Satan's plan for your life? See, I've thought a lot about like what's God's plan for my life. And we quote Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. You may have heard that. He has a good plan for your life. In fact, it's the best plan for your life. It's even better than the one you dream of in your mind. But I haven't thought a lot about what Satan's plan for my life is. And that's what I wanna uh, address this morning. And I'm gonna come back to that question. I want you to be thinking or even praying in your mind about, well, what, what is Satan's plan for my life? And I wanna give you uh, three points as we talk about how to join the spiritual battle we read about in Ephesians chapter six this morning. And these three points all have lots of sub points. So I hope you're ready for some teaching this morning, church, and get your pens out or your Evernote on your iPad and get ready to take some notes, those watching online. Here we go. The first one is this. If you wanna join the spiritual battle, First of all, you have to know who Satan is. According to the Bible, he has many names. 
the two primary names are Satan or the Satan, the Ha Satan or Satan, which means adversary or accuser. You can find that in Job chapter one. Now I'm gonna give you a lot of Bible references. They won't all be on the screen. You can jot them down quickly or email us at info at mercyroad.cc and I can send you these references. Another name for Satan is the devil. I read a quote from him earlier. The devil is all over the New Testament. All over the New Testament, it refers to him as the devil. Those are his primary names. His secondary names that we read about in the Bible are Beelzebul, which is the name of the Philistine god of flies and dung, which is used to refer to Satan in Matthew chapter 12, verse 24. Belial, which means worthless, coming from 2 Corinthians 6.15. One of them that you're probably more familiar with is Lucifer. Lucifer, that name is found in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. And it is a prophetic message in Isaiah that many Christians believe is pointing to Satan as being an angel who fell from heaven. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But the name Lucifer is actually the Latin word, you ready for some preaching this morning, the Latin word for morning star that you find in Isaiah chapter 14. And when it, the New Testament and Old Testament were translated into Latin, uh, the Latin Vulgate version of the Bible, it used the term Lucifer. And so that's where that name came from in Isaiah 14. We all tracking? Satan is thought to be one of the, the leader of the fallen angels. He's not the pitchfork devil that you wore at Halloween. He is actually an angel of light. He is, was thought to be beautiful and was to lead the angels in musical worship. Really cool thing, side note. Um, wasn't New Breed pretty cool up here this morning? And I want to let you know, I was talking to him before the service, and he was just talking about how God actually created music. It's his, and how he desired to use it for worship. And so his desire is to use uh, those skills and music to reach the youth culture. He's actually a youth pastor, uh, but he's got his CDs out in the lobby. So I encourage you, wipe him out of those this morning. I really want to encourage him what God's doing in his life uh, together. But originally, Satan was the angel of music or of light. Now, I want to give you some titles. Those are the names of Satan, but here are some of the titles, just a few of them that we read about in Scripture. The Angel of Light, I just mentioned. The Deceiver. The Destroyer. The Father of Lies. The Accuser. The Chief of the Demons. The Prince of Darkness. The Blasphemer. Now, when you see these different titles, I want you to begin to think about where in your life do you see God tempting you, or excuse me, not God, Satan, tempting you with each of these particular titles that he has, the father of lies. Some of you ladies this morning, you are hearing this over and over again. You are not as pretty as that other woman that used five filters on her Instagram picture that she posted online. Some of you are hearing this morning that you are not as popular or as powerful as that particular person at work, and so your life does not matter as much as theirs does. Some of you are hearing this morning that you're always going to be a bad father. You're never going to change. That's just the way you are. Your dad was a bad dad. You're going to be a bad dad. Some of you in this room, you have been hearing from the father of lies. Some of you, you have been hearing from the accuser. You've made mistakes and you've messed up. And you know it and you've acknowledged it and you've received the forgiveness of, of Jesus but the Satan is going to continue to use that one mistake you made to bring it back up and back up and back up. And he's going to accuse you over and over again. Some of you have known the fear of Satan in your life, the chief of the demons, and you make your decisions in life based off of fear. Like, what if I don't have enough money? What if I don't have uh, enough uh, power at work? What if I don't have the life that I really want some of you, the prince of darkness just sits over you like a cloud and you live in darkness always and you feel like it will always be like that. 
See, if you don't begin to acknowledge the spiritual battle in which you find yourself, if you don't begin to name that there is an accuser, that there is a chief of demons, a prince of darkness, a blasphemer of God that is causing you to rebel against God and blaspheme and fight back with him, you're gonna miss the whole point. If you don't acknowledge the angel of light that doesn't come with the pitchfork but is beautiful and attractive to you when you are online and you see that picture, the angel of light loves to draw you in just a little bit closer. If you don't realize the deceiver is deceiving you, you're going to be going down a path with yourself or your family or your friends or your dating life, and you're going to be deceived about how to actually honor God in those areas, and it's going to lead to destruction in your life, in your family, in your workplace that we all track in this morning. Those are the titles and the, the powers and the authorities that Satan so often plays in our life. And if you're like, well, I don't believe that. Here's the real struggle for me as a young Christian when I began to study the Bible on this. It would be really hard to call yourself a follower of Jesus and not believe that. Because Jesus clearly believed that in the New Testament. I mean, in, in Luke chapter four, he is tempted by Satan in the wilderness for 40 days. And he comes out of that and he professes to that and it repeatedly refers to the devil in the New Testament. It's not some weird kooky thing that some mystical people that don't believe in rooted scripture-based Christianity believe. This is actually the Bible. For some of us, we have difficulty with that idea of a fallen angel, yet humanity has rebelled against God and have fallen out of God's graces at time. Why would it not be true for angels as well? C.S. Lewis writes this in the Screw Tape Letters, there is no uncreated being except God. God has no opposite. Right? For some of us, we think of like the Bible, we think of like this ultimate cosmic battle between God and between Satan. Like that is not biblical at all. It is not a cosmic battle between God and Satan. God is the only, the only uncreated being. He created everything. He redeems whatever he chooses, and he allowed both humanity and uh, angels to have some form of free will or at least choice in their life. And so C.S. Lewis goes on and says, the proper question is whether I believe in devils. I do. That is to say, I believe in angels. And I believe that some of these, by the abuse of their free will, have become enemies to God. Satan, the leader or dictator of devils, is the opposite, not of God, but of Michael, the archangel. And so it would be angels and demons is the idea of the cosmic battle, not God. God is sovereign. He is all powerful. He's the only uncreated being. He is more powerful than any form of temptation Satan could ever bring your way. If you want to join the spiritual battle, you have to know who Satan is. Number two, if you're taking notes, you then need to know that Satan has his limitations. He's not God. Stay quick with me. Here we go. His limitations, number one, he is accountable to God. He is accountable to God. And according to Job 1, verse 6, he's not omni-anything. He's not omnipresent. Job 1, 17, 1 Peter 5, 8. He's not omnipotent. He's not all-powerful. Revelation 12, 7. He's not omniscient, meaning he's not all-knowing. Job 1, 1 John 4, 4. Number three, he has limits, according to Job 1 and Luke 22. And number four, Christians can resist him, according to James 4, verse 7, and 1 Peter 5, verses 8 to 9. Satan does not, if you are a Christian, Satan does not have control of your life. You see, in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 13, verse 13, it says this very clearly. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you have a relationship with God through his crucifixion and resurrection, you can know a perfect God. If that is you here this morning, there is no temptation beyond what you can bear. God is way more powerful than anything else you will experience in this life. And so what most of us then do is this. We realize, oh, you're right. I'm, I call myself a Christian and yet I keep failing. Right, this, this message became important to me this week because I, I had to have this pointed out to me, but I had failed in there. I didn't even realize I'd failed in. I began to feel a little guilt over that. You been there? 
And, and when that happened, uh, it was real easy for me to go, oh man, I know Jesus. I shouldn't do that anymore. Well, how did that happen in my life? I didn't even know that was happening. You been there? And suddenly you keep making these same mistakes and you begin to think there just must be something wrong with me. I'm not like those great Christians out there. You know what I'm talking about. Like you walked in here this morning and some of you saw like a family. They got out of their like 15 passenger van and their 12 kids marched in in a straight road together. And there was all these please and thank yous and yes, ma'am, yes, sir. And they were hugging each other on the way into their class after they skipped down the hall together. And some of you couldn't get them into the car without saying very mean, hateful things at them this morning to motivate them. I, I want to tell you that when you fail, it's not God that wants you to wallow in the self-pity of that failure. When it happens, it's not God who wants you to sit there and go, I am messed up. I'm not as good as that other person. I'm always going to be this way. I'm a failure. That self-pity, that wallowing in your sin does not come from God. It comes from your enemy. There is no temptation beyond what you can bear. But when you make a mistake, the good grace of Jesus Christ is what you must latch onto and actually genuinely believe that God forgives you and allow him to take that baggage off of your shoulders that you've been carrying around. See, Satan has limitations. He's not God. The one who is can bring freedom and forgiveness. And he can, the Satan cannot stop it. Number three, if you're taking notes, you need to then defend against Satan in your life. And you do that by being aware of his schemes. Second Corinthians 2, 10 to 11 says, anyone you forgive, I also forgive. And what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake. In order that, Satan might not outwit us, for we not, are not unaware of his schemes. We are not unaware of his schemes. I asked you this question at the very beginning. What is Satan's plan for your life? You see, we could say all kinds of things to answer that question. He wants you to make mistakes. He wants you to give in to the temptation. He wants you to fail. He wants to destroy things in your life. He wants you to believe his lives. He wants to deceive you. But at the heart of it, I was thinking about this this week. See, sometimes it's not even really bad things. They distract us. Sometimes Satan used good things, but not God's best. What Satan really desires to do is to get you to love anything, love anything more than God. For some of you, it is giving in to that addictive habit that you have had, and you click that link again, and you gave in to that particular uh, drug or alcohol addiction. You looked at that, and you, Satan got you in that moment to just desire that more than God himself. But for others of you, he gets you to desire that relationship with your boyfriend or your girlfriend or even really silly things, right? Like he gets us to love our kids' elementary sports career more than we love God, Right? He gets us to love the new purchase of that vehicle more than we love God. The desire for that house is more important than our, our love of God. Look, there's nothing wrong with some of those things, but when the good things get in the way of God's best, Satan has won because he's tricked us into giving in to something good rather than God's best in our lives. His goal is to get you to love anything more than you love God. And I want to tell you, when this happens, we don't even see it coming sometimes. And for some of us in the room, we need to understand what it's like in Ephesians chapter six, when Paul is writing to a really messed up culture in Ephesus around 60 AD, he's trying to encourage and challenge them to prepare themselves, acknowledge the spiritual battle in which they find themselves. When you are fighting with your spouse, if you are a Christian, your fight is not with her. It's not with him. We are just fallen human beings that are giving in to the deception of the enemy that we find ourselves battling. When you are at workplace, I know your fight is with your horrible, horrible boss. But from an eternal perspective, your fight is not with your boss. It's not with the family member that keeps saying mean things behind your backs. It's not with your roommate. Your fight's not even with that crazy mean person down the street that gets on the bus with your kid in the morning. Your fight is with the enemy the father of lies, the prince of darkness. 
And so we must prepare ourselves, not just for a physical battle, but a spiritual one. And so verse 15 in Ephesians chapter six, after he talked about the breastplate of righteousness, he goes on and says, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of what? The gospel of peace. The gospel of peace in the middle of the tragedy and the anger and the chaos in which you find yourself, it brings the good news of peace. Verse 16, in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So spend time in God's word, not so that you can feel guilty because you didn't read enough. I didn't read enough from the Bible this week. I'm not a good Christian. No, you do it so that you can connect with God, get to know him. It goes on in verse 18, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. How do you prepare yourself? You spend more time with God so that you begin to realize the battle that you find yourself is not against that person, is not against flesh and bones, but is against the spiritual authorities that this is relevant in this world. I'm going to read in a little while from Colossians about that, but before I do, I want to share just a couple of things with you. And I want to tell you, this is really um, meaningful this morning. Because I've seen in the lives of people, we allow the deceiver to make us think we're always going to be this particular person that just doesn't experience God at work in our life. And it is a lie straight from the pit of hell because we haven't realized the battle that we find ourselves in. You see, this morning, um, I'm going to put a slide up that's not going to go online. If you're watching live online, we don't promise it will be as good of an experience as it is live here. That's why you should come to church with us. But if you're enjoying coffee in your pajamas this morning, I get it. So I want to tell you that um, this isn't going online for some safety reasons. But we do have a missionary that is uh, sent out here from this church. Uh, We've got many missionaries. Um, One, they're going to the particular region that you see up there on your screen. They've been here for a little while, and they're having a special fundraiser that day in time. Uh, Those are their names. And again, this isn't going out online. I love this couple. They have really been able to see God use their lives in tremendous ways. They have a table out in the lobby. I encourage you, go out there, ask them a ton of questions. Come to that fundraiser, and I'll tell you why. Because they were somebody that are living out exactly what we're talking about this morning. One of them in particular, the husband, I had him write down his, his story of what has happened. I'm going to leave some of the details out. But he grew up in a small Midwestern town on a dairy farm where his parents were moral and hardworking people. However, as a teen, he became involved in white supremacist activities. And upon graduating from high school, he became involved in a white supremacist group The group used parts of scripture to justify their actions as this person grew in the Lord and reading more of his Bible began to question their actions. They said he was too young to understand the Bible for himself, so he stopped questioning for a time. He was later caught for his crimes he was involved in with the group and served time behind bars for white supremacist activities. People came to share the Lord with him behind the bars, but he rejected them. But the seeds of truth were planted. While on probation on his parents' farm uh, back in this particular area of the country, he began listening to radio preachers like Chuck Swindoll. One day, while he was listening, he gave his life to Christ. And the Lord uh, entered into his life, and three men became significant and began to minister to him. He would eventually go on to get a degree at a Christian college and would meet his wife. They would become devout followers of Jesus. And one day at Sunday school, they learned of some stories of some missionaries around the world. They were so moved spiritually, they believed God was calling them to a particular area of the world where there aren't many Christians. Put the area up on the screen. So get this, they received a very large inheritance of hundreds of thousands of dollars. They used all of that inheritance to go to this particular country and invest all of it in to being able to um, reach that community. You can go on that night to hear the details of it. That's some people risking everything for the cause of Christ, right? That's the type of inspirational story we all desire. Man, I want faith like that. But it really started long before they ever got an inheritance, 
It started all the way back when this young person was a white supremacist behind bars who had an authentic encounter with the risen Jesus, and that dramatically changes his life where he genuinely believes he no longer has to be that guy. And over the course of time, like Saul, who becomes Paul, who was a terrorist in his own day, by the way, overseeing the killing of Christians, he encounters the risen Jesus. He gives his life to Christ. Over 14 years, he has his life changed. He does three missionary journeys. He ends up in a prison cell in Rome, writing a letter to a church in Ephesus around 60 AD, and writes most of the New Testament, starts most of the churches in the Roman Empire, because that's how Jesus works. See, some of you, you feel like you are so surrounded by darkness, you will never be able to change. I want to tell you that as a lie from the pit of hell, it's not God that wants you to wallow in your, your unforgiveness and your sorrow and your self-pity. I want to show you a very quick video, and I want to use this as an illustration. It's only about 60 seconds long. I want to tell you the first 20 seconds, especially for those of us who are pet lovers, are very hard to watch. So if you don't like that sort of thing, close your eyes for the first 20 seconds. I promise you it gets much more redemptive, but I want to use this as a picture for what we're talking about this morning. Let's watch this 60-second video together. Isn't that incredible? The restoration, like you can't even acknowledge, you couldn't even tell what type of breed that was. You might not even have been able to tell it was a dog. And then at the end, you see this beautiful border collie. And I wonder for how many of us, God created us in a particular way, and we began to serve a bad master. And when you serve a bad master, some evil, dark things can occur. And, and we, it's not like the dog desired that. It's not the dog's fault, but it happened. And for some of us in the room, we need to experience, we think I will always be like this and you don't know how good your master is. You see, when he discovers a good master, he has a restorative work done in his life that is apparent to everyone, and he finally fulfills his calling as a border collie. I know that's a bit strange, but for us as Christians, we have a whole lot more than just growing some fur back in our life. Some of us spiritually need a restorative work done, and when we serve a good master, I want to tell you that it is possible. You think that you will always struggle with this particular issue. It keeps creeping back up. And not God, but the enemy keeps wanting to tell you to just wallow in your self-pity and sorrow. Think it's all because you're just not good enough. You're not a good enough Christian. Or do like some of us do. Instead of blame yourself, begin to blame other people. Your spouse or, or your parents or your kids or, or your brother or your sister. Or you even begin to blame God, right? The good master that you serve desires for you to come home, to find healing, to find restoration, and become the person you were created to be. You have been fighting all the wrong battles, and you have not acknowledged the spiritual forces in which you are finding yourselves tempted by. Colossians 2, 13, church, as we close this out, says, when you were dead in your sins... And the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive. Get this, he forgave us all. He forgave us all our sins. And some of you, you have accepted his forgiveness in some chosen areas in the really dark recesses of your soul. You don't allow him to creep in because you just feel like you're not good enough. I'm never going to be like that. I can't experience the change that we read about in the New Testament. It happens. It happens today. There are missionaries going around the world who used to be a white supremacist because God restored his life and gave him a new one and said, hey, here's now your purpose. Go fulfill it. That's what Jesus does in our lives. 
That's the restoration that can happen in you and can happen in me for all of our sins. Having canceled the charge of our illegal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. Maybe some of you need to nail it to the cross this morning. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. We do not serve a weak, apathetic, distant God. We serve a God who throughout human history had pursued us and pursued us and pursued us. And no matter how much the father of lies and the accuser distracts us and destroys our lives, he can still restore us if we turn to him. He is all powerful God, creator of the heaven and the earth. He is an awesome God. And he desires to bring you home and for you to find healing and restoration. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, I thank you for the the courage in the room to be able to address the spiritual reality. And God, we acknowledge your presence here. And for some of us, we're beginning to open our eyes that we've thought our battles with our, our husband or our wife We thought our battle was with people at work. We thought our battle was with something else. And this morning we acknowledge our battle is with our enemy, the leader of fallen angels. And we ask, Lord Jesus, that you would prepare our hearts for some of us as Christians. God, we need to receive some of your forgiveness this morning because we have allowed bitterness, self-pity to set in. And it's overwhelming. And we don't know who to turn to And we don't think you'll really forgive us or really make a difference, but it does. And so if that is you here this morning, you consider yourself a Christian, I want to invite you to receive the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ in your life, to have forgiveness in that area that you have just been struggling with, and know that he completely, not just partially, completely forgives you for all wrongdoing. And so I invite you to pray this silently as I pray it out loud. God, I confess that I am not perfect. I acknowledge that you are. And so because of your work on the cross and your resurrection from the grave, I ask for forgiveness and restoration in this particular area of my life. Not out loud, but just quietly in your own mind, confess whatever it is to him. We're sorry, God. We thank you for who you are, that you are not just a good master. You're the best master possible. Restore our souls this morning. For some of us in the room right now, we walked in here and it's our first time we've been around a space like this in a long time. So we just pray, Lord Jesus, that if we've come in here and we've encountered you, maybe if some of us this morning even need to surrender our lives to you, whether for the first time or to recommit our lives, we invite you to pray this with us. God, please forgive me for all my wrongdoing. I thank you for your crucifixion and resurrection. And so on this morning, I commit my life to you fully I desire desire to serve my perfect master, and that's you. Use me. I accept your plan and reject the enemies. We love you, Lord Jesus. We give you this morning. And all God's family said, amen.